when America was attacked on the morning of 9-11. Another one just hit the building. Wow. Oh, my God. Oh, God. Hundreds of hours of military and air traffic control conversations were captured on tape. I can't get a hold of the United 175 at all. Recovered from government archives, now, for the first time, they're pieced together in full. Our level one is, got stabbed. What? Oh! What was that? They reveal the chaos. Betty, talk to me. Betty, do you think you lost her? I think we might have lost her. Total confusion. We have some planes. Nobody move. Just get me somebody who has the authority to get military here now. And the chilling reality of just how unprepared America was for its ultimate day of reckoning. I don't know where I'm scrambling these guys to. I need a direction, a destination. Our communications were not designed for this type of a war. We have no idea where he's going. No idea, sir. Our interactions were not designed for this type of war. This is 737. Hey, what? Like the World Trade. Who are you talking to? Sort of fighters. They're going direct to Washington. The vast infrastructure that had been built to protect the country had completely failed. They're going direct to Washington. A new type of war. That's what it is. September 11th, 2001 was a uh, beautiful weather day. It was beautiful. There was not a cloud in the sky. It was really, really blue. Good morning, ground. FedEx 3601 Heavy. Push back from cargo in November. Point seven five. Good morning. Morning. For Ben Sliney, September the 11th was his first day as the new chief of air traffic control at the FAA. It was brilliantly clear. Uh, I arrived around 6 and quite frankly thought that I would have uh, quite an easy day of it uh, for the first day on shift. 1043 monitor ground point 9, I'll call you in sequence. Have a good ride. Have a good day. Just outside Syracuse in upstate New York is NEADS, the Northeast Air Defense Sector. Their responsibility is to defend the eastern seaboard of America from enemy attack. On September the 11th, Colonel Bob Marr was overseeing a routine military exercise, Operation Vigilant Guardian, which simulated an attack by Russian bombers on North America. Our primary mission was to defend the United States from external threats. This first day would be mostly to make sure that we followed procedures and requirements as established and build up to what I would suspect later on in the week could be a full-blown World War III or, or some variation thereof. You just never knew really what was going to happen in those exercises. For the military, it's a regular day, and the mood on the operations floor is relaxed. OK, a couch, a love seat, an ottoman, and what else? Oh. I was like, OK, we paid $200 for it. It's blue, it's big, you know, and poofy. 23-year-old Stasha Roundtree was an ID technician. Her job was to identify the locations of potential enemy aircraft. She'd finished her training just six weeks before 9-11. Was it on sale? Yeah. Mm. What color is it? Holy smokes. No matter how trivial, almost every word these people say in both military and air traffic control centers is recorded. It didn't matter if it was midnight, you know, or two in the morning. As soon as you picked up a phone or were plugged in with somebody else, you were automatically recorded. Every transmission, every voice communication between the controllers and the pilots are all recorded. At 8.09 a.m., Boston Air Traffic Control makes routine contact with the captain of American Airlines Flight 11. American 11, Boston. Boston Center, good morning, American 11 with you, passing through 190, 230. American 11, Boston, Center, Roger, climb maintain level above 280. The supervisor in charge at Boston was Dan Bueno. Nothing was uh, 
was strange or out of, out of the ordinary. But just five minutes later, at 8.14, Boston loses contact with the plane's captain. American 11, Boston. American 1-1, one, one, uh, the American on the frequency. How do you hear me? This is Boston. I turned American 20 left and I was in a clam. He will not respond to me now. Looks at all. like he's turning right. Yeah, I turned him 20 right. He I'm won't not answer you. He's Nardo. Roger. All right. Thanks. All of a sudden, the, the aircraft goes uh, no radio. American 11, if you hear Boston Center, I can please or acknowledge. American 11, if you hear Boston Center, uh, recontact Boston Center on 127.82. That's American 11, 127.82. At 8.19, a phone call comes into an American Airlines reservation office from a flight stewardess on board American 11. Ma'am, what seat are you in? Well, I thought we just left Boston and we're up in the air. We're supposed to go to L.A. and the cockpit's not answering their phone. Okay, but what seat are you sitting in? What's the number of your seat? Okay, I'm in my jump seat right now. Okay. That's 3R. What is your name? Okay, my name is Betty Ong. I'm number 3 on flight 11. And the cockpit is not answering their phone. And there's somebody staffed in business class. And there's, we can't breathe in business class. Somebody's got mates or something. Can you describe the person that you said someone is what in business class? Um, I, our, our number one is got staff. Uh, our person is staff. Um, nobody knows who's staff who. And we, we can't even get up to business class right now because nobody can breathe. And we can't get a, the cockpit, the door won't open. Hello? In Boston, air traffic control are still unable to make contact with the aeroplane. American 1-1, one, one, uh, the American on the frequency, how do you hear me? American 11, if you hear Boston Center, I can please or acknowledge. Then, at 8.24, a voice directly from the plane's cockpit. We have some planes, just stay quiet and you'll be okay. We are turning to the airport. And uh, who's trying to call me here? American 11, are you trying to call? Nobody move. Everything will be okay. If you try to make any move, you'll danger yourself and the airplane. Just stay quiet. Like a punch in the gut, it was just a very unnerving, you know, sense of, you know, uh, helplessness. In Boston, flight service manager Michael Woodward received a phone call from onboard American 11. It was from one of his staff, flight attendant Amy Sweeney. She said, you know, thank God it's you. Listen to me and listen to me very carefully. Michael's phone line is not recorded. So he relays the conversation to a colleague sitting next to him, who passes on the details to American Airlines headquarters. OK, we've got the flight attendants on the line here. Amy Sweeney? Yeah, she's the number nine. So I'm, I'm going to read his notes for you. Um, it looks like uh, he's Middle Eastern, he speaks no English. He was in 10B, 10 Baker, right. 9D and G, speaks no, speaks no English. Uh, the plane's in a rapid descent. Okay, the flight attendants are concerned they don't know what's going on in the cockpit. Are you in con contact with them? Okay, it looks like there is severe bleeding that uh, okay. he's keeping them, keeping her on the line. Um, there's severe bleeding. There is a slashed throat. Michael, is that severe? Is that slash throat a flight attendant? No. By 8.29, American 11 has been out of contact with air traffic control for 15 minutes. Dan Bueno in Boston alerts the FAA command center. I got a little situation with American 1-1 and American 11. And let me get managers in the formal. And I'm heading southwest, 29. Heading southbound. Heading southwestbound. He's 
Does he have no idea where he's going? No idea, sir. I start to think, what do I do here now? Four minutes later, at 8.33, Bueno breaks standard hijack protocol and contacts his nearest Air Force base, Otis, in Massachusetts. I am going to call from Washington. I have a situation with American 11, a possible hijack. American 11? Yes, sir, departed Boston, went to LAX. Right now, he's top of all, and he'd like to scramble some fighters to go tell him. But the order to scramble jets at Otis must come from NEADS in upstate New York, where they are just about to begin their military exercise, Operation Vigilant Guardian. Hi, Boston Center, Team U. We have a, a problem here. We have a hijacked aircraft headed towards New York, and we need you guys to, we need someone to scramble some F-16s or something up there. Is this real world or exercise? No, this is not an exercise manifest. He didn't preface real world or exercise, and that's where my quote comes in, is this real world or exercise? He said, no, this is real world. It's like, OK. OK, hey, uh, hold on one second, OK? Yep. Hey, 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 here's the TV. On the operations floor, the ID technicians overhear the word hijack. What? Oh. What was that? Our first reaction, I know you heard there, was like, cool, because this was usually not something that was very devastating. So we all, you know, nonchalantly opened up our checklists and starting to do what we had to do for a hijack. I remember distinctly seeing several people huddled around one of the radar scopes. That is usually not a good sign. Immediately, a call is issued to superiors. Major Nisipani, you're needed in Ops Prato. Major Nisipani, you're needed in Ops Prato. The mission crew commander, who was uh, Kevin Nisipani at this time, he is basically in charge of that entire operations floor. He is the most senior guy on the floor. Uh, real world hijack, 40 miles north of Kennedy. Do you have time to give me any other Yeah. Like notice on battle station. Floyd, notice on battle station. The first thing I'd directed was uh, for the fighters to go to battle stations. And that really just takes the pilots that are on alert and puts them in the cockpit. But there are over 3,000 commercial aircraft in the skies, and NEADs have no location reference for the hijacked plane. We need a location for our fighters to be able to go up there and, and you know, single out that aircraft. But the hijackers are one step ahead of both the military and civilian authorities they've turned off the plane's transponder. We rely on the transponder, a coded signal that is transmitted from each aircraft in the system. It tells our computer the aircraft's uh, call sign, speed, and altitude. We're checking to get some information from you if we could. It's uh, American 11. He's heading yep. towards Kennedy. It uh, looks like his speed is decreasing. Uh, I'm not exactly sure where. Nobody really. Once the hijackers uh, turned off the transponder, in all respects, it, he was quite invisible to us. And where are they going now, do you know? No idea. In 2006, homegrown Al-Qaeda were plotting to blow up seven planes with liquid explosive. You're talking about 2,000 lives. Only now, the story can be told of just how close we came to disaster. The plot to bring down Britain's planes, next Thursday at 9 on 4. With Flight American 11 hijacked out of Boston, NEADS, the Northeast Air Defense Sector, are desperately trying to locate the missing plane. The aircraft is seven minutes away from the World Trade Center and the hijackers have turned off its transponder. These guys knew what they were doing. They knew that we needed this to locate them. They turned it off, they went lower, they went slower, everything, you know, to, to stop us from being able to get that exact location. Is he inbound to JFK? We, we don't know. <laughs> you don't know where he is at all? He's being hijacked, the pilot's having a hard time talking. And both sides are doing everything they can 
to try and identify where this American Airlines Flight 11 Heavy is. And there's just not a whole lot of information for them to give. Using only basic radar estimates, Dan Bueno knows American 11 is approaching New York. He calls to inform them. Okay, hey, Drake on high Boston Center. Uh, good morning, it's American 11. Uh, 767 possible hijack. Okay, American 11, 75 and uh, Bedford. Where's he landing? Uh, right now, we don't have any idea, but uh, he was losing speed okay. very rapidly. And uh, we believe he's on the descent. That's why he's, uh, he's, he's wow. slowing down. We were just monitoring him and trying to keep airplanes out of his way. That's what you do with a hijack at that time. Back at American Airlines, flight attendant Amy Sweeney is still on the line to her boss, Michael Woodward, directly from the hijacked plane. She was increasingly alarmed and she said, you know, the airplane's all over the place, something's happening. You know, we're flying, you know, erratically. Um, we're, we're, we're in a rapid descent. The call is not recorded, but Michael relays the details to a colleague sitting next to him, who is on the line to American Airlines headquarters. She started screaming and saying something's wrong and now he's having trouble. No. Okay. Now he thinks he might be disconnected. Okay, we just lost um, connection. Lost the connection. Yeah. Something's wrong with the airplane? Yeah. I just sat there for a second and thought, okay, well, hopefully she's going to call back. At exactly the same time, the reservations desk are trying to keep the line open with the only other contact on the hijacked plane, Amy's colleague, Betty Ong. Okay, I'm still on with security, okay, Betty? You're doing a great job. Just, just stay calm, okay? We are, absolutely. What's going on, honey? Okay, the aircraft is erratic again. Bobby, very erratic. What's going on, Betty? Betty, talk to me. Betty, are you there? Betty? We, I think we might have lost her. Okay. With American 11 descending rapidly over New York, F-15s at Otis are ordered to chase it down. There's hundreds with an active air defense scramble for Santa 4546. Scramble immediately. FCC, I don't know where I'm scrambling these guys to. I need a direction, uh, destination. But just as the fighter jets are preparing to take off, I started getting a lot of reports from airplanes as saying, what's going on in New York? There's a lot of smoke coming out of the Trade Center. Tenant Tower reports that there was a fire at the World Trade Center. And that's, uh, that's the area where we lost the airplane. I remember uh, me and Dan Bueno looking at each other, and it's like, that wouldn't have been American 11. Could it have been? Could it be? Is there any a plane just landed right there? What? No, sir. Is it 737? Hey, what? Like the World Trade Center. Who are you center. talking to? Get past, past it to them. Oh, my God. Oh, God. Oh, my 
God. I shot him in his back lane to crash the World Trade Center. An airplane just hit the World Trade Center. And I parroted that back to everybody. Uh, yes, ma'am, did you just hear the information regarding the World Trade Center? No. Being hit by an aircraft? I'm oh, sorry? Being hit by an aircraft. It's, it's on the world news. Almost immediately at that point, the controller just next to me says, I've got another situation right here. United 175, New York. United 175, do you read New York? United 175, do you read New York? I actually turned to the supervisor and I said, I think I have another hijacking going on over here. We have some problems over here right now. I can't get a hold of the United 175 at all right now. And I don't know where he went to. With the World Trade Center in flames and another aircraft reported missing, commanders at NIAD's military base have abandoned Operation Vigilant Guardian and are now fully immersed in a real-world crisis. Who's plugged in up there? Plug in. I have to have you hold up. Okay, <laughs> this is what I got so far. Okay. Okay, this is what we... Okay, now we do. Yes. This is what I got. Possible news that 737 just hit the World Trade Center. This is real world. But the F-15s have only just left Otis Air Force Base. Even at top speed, they are seven minutes flying time from New York City. We aren't able to look out a window and see something. None of the fighters are close enough yet. The crash pretty much happened simultaneously at the time that, that they're getting rolling. So they're still, what, easily 170 miles away, I believe, at the time? Okay. Continue taking the fighters down to the New York City area, JFK area, as best as you can. Make sure that the FAA clears the your route all the way through. Just do what we got to do, okay? Just press with it. At 9.02, another call comes into the military from New York Air Traffic Control. They had a second possible hijack. Oh, God. I know. What phone are you on? Yeah, we found that head out there. Open line. United 175 is the other aircraft. Yeah. Oh my god. I'd say it's pretty serious. In New York, controller Dave Batilia is trying to keep a handle on the missing plane, which is fast approaching the city. He calls the tower on the runway at Newark Airport. United 175, do you read New York? 10. Hello. Do you um, see that United 175 anywhere? That United 175 that just took off out of a thing. We might have a hijack over here, two of them. I knew something bad was going on. They're not responding to any transmissions. United 175, New York. And all of a sudden, he started to make a radical descent. Hey, can you look out your window right now? Can you see God about 4,000 feet, about 5 east of your airport right now? Looks like he's... Oh, yeah, I see him. Did you see God? Look, is he descending for the building also? He's descending really quick too, yeah. Well, that's... Oh, he's 500 feet now. He just dropped 800 feet in like, a, like one, one sweep. That's, that's another situation. Who, what kind of airplane is that? Can you guys tell? I don't know. I'll read it out in a minute. As he got down to around 2000, he says, oh my God, he's in the ground on the next hit. And then somebody yelled out, oh my God, that's the Trade Center right there. very loud, busy air traffic control area became absolutely dead silent. It 
sickening. All of us, I, I can remember there was absolutely no talking going on. Everybody was like in shock. I think an airplane just plowed into the city. I, they did. Uh, uh, the World Trade Center hit the top. No, of the another one. We just saw another one do it. Another one? Yeah. Holy cow. He says, hey, another one just hit. And it was, you know, now we're like freaking out, basically. Like, uh, what what's going on now? It's like we have no idea what's going on. At Niad's military base, 200 miles away, they're watching the nightmare unfold live on television. Boston Is this explosion plane. part of that that we're looking at now on TV? Boston yes. is now grounding. Oh, it is yeah. possible Boston. second hijack of the United Airlines. Center. 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 Where they're working at right now. Two planes? He was in Whiskey 105. Get the fuck up. Holy cow. That made everybody sink, and I swear everybody at the same time just kind of, it was like, I don't even know how to explain it. Just uh, that real, it's real, it's happening. People are being killed. With America now under direct attack, there's still no sign of fighter jets over New York. The second one just hit the Trade Center. Okay. Yeah, we gotta get to. We gotta alert the military uh, uh, real quick on this. Uh. No, we have several situations going on here. It's uh, escalating big, big time. That we need to get the military involved with us. Wow, what's going on? Just get me somebody who has the authority to get military in the air now. All right. But by 9:07, four minutes after the second plane hit, the F-15s are still over 100 miles outside Manhattan. What I foresee that we probably need to do. We need to talk to FAA. We need to tell them if this stuff is going to keep on going. We need to take those fighters, put them over Manhattan. Okay? Because we don't know how many guys are out of pocket. This three two could be more. I don't know. That's the best thing. That's the best play right now. Okay? And the bad news just keeps coming. American 77, Indy. American 77, American Indy Radio. Check out of your read. There wasn't even a minute or two delay when the other controller said, we got a problem here. This is uh, Henderson, American 77. I don't know what happened to him. I'm trying to Probably reach him. Probably hitting anyone for us during that 37. Looks like he turned, took a turn to the south, and uh, now I'm, uh, I don't know what altitude he's at or what he's doing. Over Indianapolis, another plane has gone off the radar. Two hijacked planes have hit the World Trade Center in New York. Over Indianapolis, another plane has gone missing. Realizing that America is under attack, the FAA order no more takeoffs across the entire country. I directed that uh, no other flights be allowed to depart in the United States, a national ground stop order, at least gaining partial control in that there would be no more aircraft joining the national airspace system. There are over 4,000 planes in the sky, and amongst all the confusion at 9.21, NIADS, the Northeast Air Defense Sector, receive a report of yet another hijacked plane. Military at Boston Center just had a report that American 11 is still in the air and it's on its way towards heading towards Washington. Okay, American 11 is still in the air on yes, its way towards was Washington. Another, there was definitely another aircraft that hit the tower. That's the latest report we have. The information is relayed across the floor. Oh, hi, Jack. It's heading towards Washington. Shit. Give me a location. Yeah, yeah, right now. That's the one we have. Okay. Third aircraft hijack heading towards Washington. Yeah. The new sighting of American 11 is actually a mistake. American 11 is the plane that hit the World Trade Center 35 minutes earlier. The ops floor is being bombarded by multiple inputs at any one given time. There are a lot of things being reported, and not all of them are accurate. Because of this error, NIADs now believe another hijacked plane is heading towards the Capitol. 
and they have to take action. Okay, uh, American Airlines is still airborne. 11, the first guy, he's heading towards Washington. Okay, I think we need to scramble Langley right now, and I'm going I'm to take the fighters from Otis and try to chase this guy down if I can find him. You sure? Yeah. Foxy, scramble Langley, head towards the Washington area. Roger that. Fighter jets are ordered to scramble from Langley Air Force Base in Virginia, and they head eastward on a standard flight path. But 400 miles away, yet more trouble is about to break out. Cleveland Air Traffic Control are in routine contact with United 93. United 93, that traffic through is 1 o'clock, 12 miles eastbound, 370. Negative contact, we're looking at United 93. Somebody call Cleveland. The sounds of screaming are coming directly from the cockpit. And just four minutes later, control overhear another chilling message. Calling Cleveland Center, you're unreadable. Say again slowly. Back at NIADS, the operations floor receive yet another hijack report. Okay, let me tell you this. I, I, we were looking, we also lost American 77. Okay, American 77, where was he proposed to head for? Excuse me? Where was he proposed to head, sir? Okay, he was going to LA also. He was also going to LA. They lost contact with him, they lost everything, and they don't have any idea where he is or what happened. Now there's an American 77 that they believe to be coming. So we think we have two headed that direction. Just one minute later, at 9.35, more news comes in about one of the two missing planes believed to be over Washington, the Phantom American 11. Uh, latest report, the aircraft VFR is six miles southeast of the White House. Six miles southeast of the White House? Yep. East. You don't know who he is? Nothing, nothing. We're in Boston, so I have no clue. But... Six miles is just seconds in flying time. The White House is now in imminent danger. You know, we, honest to God, thought we were literally being attacked from all angles. With the capital under attack, the military call in the Langley fighters. Okay, Foxy, I got an aircraft six miles east of the White House. Turning But the F-16s from Langley are 60 miles off the coastline, 150 miles away from the capital. Colonel Nasipani, in charge at Niads, realizes they've flown the wrong way. Why'd they go up there? Because guys Damn it. got really, really pissed. He gave a direction to fly jets directly north, uh, but they were sent uh, out towards the east. And you heard him say, well, what the hell did they send him out there for? Why'd they go up there? Because guys out there. OK. Our mission was really to protect the United States from a threat over water. So you had standardized scramble procedures that take you out over water. Colonel Nasipani orders the F-16s back to the capital. OK, push them back. Is that airliner? No, run them. To the White House. Eight, two, one, two, one, three, eight. What are we doing? We're going direct to East. Oh, yeah, guys. Yeah. For reference, Whiskey, they're going direct Washington. Five, they're going direct Washington. It was, you know, light them up. Let's get them down there where they need to be. Hey, you need to get those back up. Okay. We'll call them super to get there. You need to be. I don't care how many windows you break. Major recipient was, uh, I don't care how many windows you break. Go supersonic. You know, two jets have already hit. You know, the two towers. You know, rules are out the window right now. You know, we're getting there. Even at full speed, the F-16s are at least five minutes away. 
while they are still in the air. Oh my goodness, oh my goodness. Live picture from Washington. There is smoke pouring out of the Pentagon. The plane that smashed into the Pentagon wasn't the Phantom American 11, believed to be heading for the White House, but in fact the other missing plane, American 77. Okay, the aircraft that is covered by the White House is now near the Pentagon. I don't know where the hell they're getting there until I said Washington has no clue when I called Washington about it. They didn't know what the hell was going on. What is this thing that's going on TV now? I don't know. Hello? 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 What the fuck is this about? And I'm like, they hit the Pentagon. They hit the freaking Pentagon. And I looked at Sergeant Dooley. And she's no kidding doing this and looking at me and these tears are coming down. And I said, hey, we don't have time for that. Turn around, do your job. Go ahead. The Pentagon just got hit. Delta CNN. God damn it, I can't even protect them like an NCA. We've gone from uh, this peacetime, pure peacetime environment, almost into full wartime within an hour. Uh, it, it was, it was pretty dramatic. What's next? World Trade Centers, Pentagon, the White House was just mentioned. You know, what could they possibly do now? With the headquarters of the American military now hit, Ben Sliney at the FAA decides to clear the skies of America of all civilian aircraft. I wanted to gain control over the situation. In my mind, we, there were missiles flying around, and I wanted to take as many out of the sky as possible. What was left, we'd, we'd have to deal with, either militarily or in some other fashion. But while NIADs are attempting to defend the capital, and the FAA are trying to clear the skies, one flight over Cleveland is causing concern for local air traffic controllers. At 9.34, Cleveland Control notifies the FAA command center. United 93 may have a bomb on board. Okay, United 93, who's speaking? Cleveland Center. Okay, and can you give me any additional information as to why you believe there may be a bomb? Uh, because he's screaming that on the frequency. Two minutes later, Cleveland calls the FAA again. United 93 has now turned around and is flying back towards Washington. They ask for immediate military support. Our question here is our, our aircraft that we have has climbed, turned, and is not talking to us. So do we want to scramble? We got a couple of local military here. Okay, that's a decision that has to be made at a different level. Or is someone talking about it at least? What's the call sign again? It's United 93. He's right, right over Cleveland. But the FAA did not pass on this vital information about United 93 to the military. As things turned out, uh, the FAA headquarters never notified the military about, uh, about United 93. The military learned about it almost by accident. I don't think it's a valid question to ask whether they talked with us enough. It's that our communications were not designed for this type of a war. Our interactions were not designed for this type of a war. At 9.39, United 93's hijackers mistakenly broadcast an announcement meant for the passengers on board. Hi, the captain. I would like to all to remain seated. We are home aboard and we are going to take the airport and to have our demand. So please remain quiet. Passengers on board United 93 start making calls to loved ones. Mark Bingham phones his mother but gets cut off. She calls back and leaves him a message. 47 a.m. Mark, this is your mom. The news is that it's been hijacked by terrorists. They are planning to probably use the plane as a target to hit some site on the ground. If you possibly can, try to overpower these guys. Try to call me back if you can. Uh, I love you, sweetie. Good luck. Bye-bye. End of message. At 
live on global television. The first World Trade Center collapses. With the Pentagon already hit, America has gone in under 60 minutes from peacetime to being in the grip of the biggest terrorist attack in its history. It would seem that the United States on this day is under attack from terrorists. Up in the skies, a fourth hijacked plane, United 93, is still heading for Washington. And the military have received no information about it. Clearly, it was a failure of the command and control structure at FAA headquarters because they had the information um, that United 93 was hijacked almost in real time, within five minutes. The bottom line was we didn't have the communication pieces that we needed. We weren't speaking to the correct people in the FAA that we probably needed to speak to. There were disconnects. There's no doubt about it. Finally, at seven minutes past 10, 39 minutes after United 93 was hijacked, a call comes through to NIADS. Uh, we got a United 93 out here. Are you aware of that? That has a bomb on board. A bomb on board. And this is confirmed. Do you have a mode 3, sir? No, we lost this transponder. But even if United 93 could be located, fighter jets have no clear guidance what to do should they intercept it. What happens when we get there? What are we going to do? Are, are we firing? We can't just arbitrarily just shoot, you know, anybody we want out of the air. Negative. Negative clearance to shoot. Jamie, 1527, Brian. God damn it, Foxy. I'm not really worried about code words. Fuck the code words. That's perishable information. Negative clearance to fire. ID type tail. Over 90 minutes after the first hijack, the military still do not have clearance to shoot down United 93 or any other hijacked plane. Just four minutes later, NIADs call Washington Air Traffic Control for more information. I also want to give you a head heads up, Washington. Go ahead. United 93, have you got information on that yet? Yeah, he's down. He's down? Yes. When did he land? Because we he, have information. He, he, did, he did not land. Oh, he's down? Yeah, down? somewhere up northeast of Camp David. Finding out that it didn't and it actually had crashed, um, it was just another plane that we couldn't stop. Northeast of Camp David. That's the, that's the last report. They don't know exactly where. This was devastating. Uh, this crash of United 93, not that none of the other ones were any less devastating or more. It's just that it's another one on top of the already three that we know. The truth is that the critical moments, the last line of defense for the country was the passengers on, on United 93 and the crew. The vast infrastructure that had been built to protect the country had completely failed. At 10.32, 29 minutes after United 93 had gone down, a vital message finally comes through to NIADS. You need to read this. Region commander has declared that we can shoot down tracks that do not respond to our uh, direct kick. I'll pass out the weapon. OK. He, he basically said, we will take lives in the air to preserve lives on the ground. OK. Hey, OK, you read that from the vice president, right? Vice President has cleared. Vice President has cleared us to intercept track. You know what they are? Yeah. Shoot them down if they do not respond first on our CC. As it turned out, there were no more hijacked planes in the sky. The order to shoot them down came too late. In many ways, Niad spent that whole morning chasing phantoms. One was really a phantom, but the other planes were hard to find. And when they did find them, it was too late. And when they got reports, the event had already happened. So they had spent these frantic, uh, you know, 100 some minutes chasing, uh, chasing phantoms and not catching one of them. These tapes reveal 
Not only the extraordinary chaos and confusion that engulfed America on the morning of 9-11, but also just how unprepared the military superpower was for the greatest terrorist attack in its history. We all had different duties and jobs to do that day, <clears throat> and uh, we all did it as best as we could. We failed, we didn't get the job done that everyone thought that we should be doing, but we'd also never been attacked like that before. And no one had ever, you know, no one ever dreamed of four hijacked aircraft in one day. You know, now we know, now we know what to look for. Now we have the defense of our homeland, we protect the domestic land space. We know that day we didn't know. That was all new. Um, I mean, it's 10 years later and we're still people still have questions. We still are trying to put those pieces together, and I think these recordings really give the public a real sense of, of what happened that day and who was involved. This gives them, I think, a really good idea of, of what happened that morning. Over the next three hours, all civilian aircraft were grounded. For two days, no commercial airlines took off. Finally, the skies over America were quiet. September 11th, 2001. A new type of war. That's what it is. Next Thursday from 9 o'clock, a terrorist plot much closer to home. The plan to blow up aeroplanes flying out of London Heathrow. Brand new next on four, we start in Melbourne, Australia, to visit one of the world's most demanding trauma centres, a truly extreme A&E.